Well, let's get started. Good afternoon, everybody. It's my great, great pleasure to have my three Danish mentors here uh, these couple of days. And today you will hear um, Dr. Gislason do his talk on uh, pharmacoepidemiology, especially drug safety, which is very close to my heart as well. Uh, Dr. Gislason is from Iceland, uh, got his MD at University of Iceland, came to Better Thoughts and moved to Denmark. Uh, where he received his cardiology training and also his PhD, which was in uh, pharmacoepidemiology as well. He re he's chairing the Danish Society of Pharmacoepidemiology, and he's done a, a great body of work. Uh, he's here today to talk to us about some of the most commonly used drugs overall, which is NSAIDs and PPIs. So no further ado. Good luck. Thank you very much. You can all hear me? Yeah, great. Uh, and thank you for... Uh, kind introduction, Emil, and thank you for the invitation to speak at the Duke University. It's a great honor to me, and uh, I'm privileged, and, and also pleased to have the opportunity to, to present uh, one of uh, some of our studies. And I will focus on uh, NSIDs and PPIs, so these are studies that I've been involved in the last uh, years, and, uh, and some of them were, uh, in, in fact, a breakthrough also for my in, in, within research. Uh, uh, and if, if we have time, I will also talk about other studies, and, and I will try to give about 10, 15 minutes uh, at the end, so we can, like, if you have any questions and discussion. So I will, I will start when, when we are, like, at, at that time. So, well, I'll, I'll talk uh, slightly, I'll start slightly to, to, like, introduce for you Denmark and, and the Danish registers. In Denmark, we are... We have a government-run uh, uh, healthcare system. It's tax financed. We pay about 50% in, in tax for salaries in Denmark, so it's, it's not free, but it's it's like uh, it's equal access to every individual in the country. The basis for that we can do this kind of research in Denmark is the Danish civil register, because uh, in Denmark every citizen is at or at immigration is provided with a personal identification number, which is permanent, it's 10 digits, and, uh, and it follows you through the, the, the whole of your life. So if you, if you immigrate to Denmark, you will be, you get this number, and if you immigrate again to USA then, and again to Denmark, you still have this number. And this allows us to like, link all those registers in Denmark. And we have a long tradition for registering healthcare data in Denmark on a nationwide scale. Uh, uh, in comparison with the U United States, uh, Denmark is a small country with 5.5 million inhabitants, but uh, still we have a, a lot of data on those persons. And, uh, and we also have a very accurate civil registry. Death is registered within 14 days of occurrence, so so we have quite accurate data and, and uh, a very little lack of, of registration. The main register we use is the Danish National Patient Registry. It has been around for over 30 years, since 1978, and it records all hospital admissions in Denmark. So each hospital admission is coded with one primary diagnosis or discharge, and if appropriate, uh, some secondary diagnosis according to the international classification of diseases. <coughs> and we have uh, also data on operations and surgical procedures that are done uh, during the hospitalization. Uh, for seven or eight years ago, the Danish uh, National Prescription Registry was given free for research. And, and uh, they have, it was established in 19. 95, and it records all pre uh, uh, prescription uh, dispensed from Danish pharmacies. And it's essentially complete because due to like, reimbursed regulations, all pharmacies are required to register the, the, the prescriptions that are claimed from the pharmacies. So it's also complete for the whole nation. And uh, we register uh, the ATC code of the, of the drug, we register data dispensing, how much are uh, quantities that dispense strength and formulation of the drug and also what kind of uh, physician is used the prescription. So, and by using this like personal identification number, we are able to link these data on the individual level. We have also other registers that we use for research. We have uh, data on uh, education, the highest level of education an individual has achieved. 
we have uh, data on income, that's tax salary for the, the individual, but also for the, for the spouse or, or the whole household, which we can use. Uh, that's very important because women usually like earn uh, less than, than men, so if you only count the, the individual income, then we get like women are constantly classified in lower socioeconomic class. We have also data on household, like marital status, uh, how many are in the household, in children, and, and, and things like that. So we have a, a lot of data, and uh, we get these data anonymous, that is, they are encrypted with the, the, the central personal number, so we get a fictional identification number that also allows us to link these registers. And we have an organization that's called Statistics Denmark, which is a government run agency that, like, keeps all these data, and we have access to remote uh, linkages uh, to this data. And there are some restrictions that we can't like, get any individual data out from the, from the, from the environment of statistics Denmark. So, so this, and, 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 and this is the basis of that we can do all these like drug safety research that I will present in this lecture here that we can like, we have this personal identification number and we can link all these registers together and like have some, uh, like have an individual uh, uh, description of the patient. And but it also allows us that we have uh, any clinical registers maybe with, with subpopulation, we can link these data on the, on the, on the with the, the national registers and like look at like if we have, a, we have some databases with surgical procedures, with invasive procedures and such as. So, but, well, I'll, I'll start to talk about NSAIDs and cardiovascular risk. And, and these are studies which have been publishing like for five, six years ago. Uh, five years ago was this. And I'll talk about patients with myocardial infarction, patients with heart failure also our studies on healthy individuals, and also some new studies we are conducting about time-related factors in the risk of NSAIDs. And uh, just to, to like show you why, why, is, why NSAIDs are so important and interesting, because they are very, very widely used. This is a study with uh, Emil Fospel, who is a research fellow here, uh, did in, in, uh, in uh, 2000 and Eight was it, yeah. And uh, and as you can see, if he, if he, he has divided the the population. There's a whole population of Denmark into eight groups, and you can see essentially within every age group there is a huge like uh, use of NSAIDs. These are claimed prescriptions. These are prescription claimed for, my, for on an NSAID, and as you can see, almost 60% of the population has claimed the prescription of an NSAID. And even if you look at the youngest population, these are individuals within like under 20 years of age. 40% of those have like uh, claimed the prescription of an NSAID. So, so it's important to like explore the cardiovascular risk of, of these drugs because they are important. And we have like studies that have shown that uh, the COX-2 inhibitors are associated with cardiovascular risk. You know that rofecoxib has been like withdrawn from the market. And uh, we started with looking at patients with, uh, with myocardial infarction. Uh, uh, the reason we were doing this was because it was after that the approved and APC studies were presented in 2005, uh, 2004, and uh, Rovicox was withdrawn from the market. And we wanted to look at, like, what, what about patients with established cardiovascular disease? And there was so much like discussion about the Cox selective COX-2 inhibitors and we wanted to look at what about the non-selective NSAIDs. Is there anything like there that could be associated with increased cardiovascular risk? And what we did was to identify a population of patients who had the first time myocardial infarction in 1995 to 2002. And, uh, and uh, we included all patients who discharged alive and then subsequently looked at their NSAID use after discharge. And uh, even though uh, we are looking at population with, with uh, established heart disease, 35% of the population were using NSAIDs after discharge. 5% uh, for each of the selective COX-2 inhibitors, ibuprofen, 17% of the population, the most commonly used, 
NSID and diclofenac, 11% uh, of the population. We saw that there were very commonly used dosages that were using it in 600 milligram on average ibuprofen and 100 milligram diclofenac. These are very ordinary dosages and also for the selective COX-2 inhibitors. We saw also that the duration of treatment is extremely short term treatment. The duration of treatment is around uh, 30 to 40 days. So these, these are not long term treatments, they are used for a short period of time. Uh, and these are the main results of the study. This is a time dependent Cox regression analysis. And, and here you have the individual drugs. I've div div divided into any use and then I'm into if they are using high or low dosages of the NSAIDs to see if there was a dose dependent increase in risk. And here you have the hazard ratios for, and this is for, for death. <coughs> And as you can see, for the selective COX-2 inhibitors, this is rofecoxib and silicoxib, for any use, you have almost 2.5 times increased risk of death. And uh, we didn't see anything for diclofenac, uh, uh, and also for, excuse me, ibuprofen 1.5 and diclofenac two times uh, higher risk of death. But what's important to look at is that high doses increase the risk of death about four to five times, and also the diclofenac, which is very, very commonly used in in Denmark and also around the world, in high doses is increase the risk as much as the selective COX-2 inhibitors, and, and rofecoxib has been removed from the market. So, well, there's also always a risk about confounding by indication when we are looking at uh, drugs like this. So, so we repeated the analysis by using the case Kosovo design, and if you like, just to remind you of what is based on this, based on the case base paradigm, like case control design, but instead of like using match controls, you use like the patient as his own control in other periods of time, close to the event. So we defined a, a, a case period of up to 30 days before the event, and control periods 60 to 90 days and 90 to 120 days before the event. And uh, here are the results of the case Kosovo analysis, and so this is the Cox regression analysis, and we essentially like replicate the results. So we, so, and and so, so well, we can't eliminate the effect of confounding by indication in these kind of studies, but it's likely that it doesn't explain all of the difference. Uh, Another study we conducted that was to look at patients with chronic heart failure, and that's interesting because guidelines essentially, like before the, the, the era of COX-2 inhibitors, they like discourage use of NSAIDs in patients with heart failure, and we all know who like treat or uh, take care of patients with heart failure that NSAIDs they increase food retention and and patients come in with decompensated heart failure due to NSAID use. So, but anyway. Also here, 30 to 40 percent of the population were using NSAIDs, and that was population uh, after discharge from heart failure uh, admission in, in Denmark. So, um, and what we found here was uh, these are like similar results, and, and what we find here is that the, the selective COX-2 inhibitors and diclofenac have the highest risk, and there is a dose-related response in risk. And, uh, and also for ibuprofen, and we also looked at naproxen because that's an interesting NSID due to that it has been considered the least cardiotoxic NSID. So, and this, this is the risk of death. We also found that it increased the risk of myocardial infarction. We repeated it in the case uh, Corsova analysis and found similar results, and we also to like to see if due to the risk of confounding by indication, we, we uh, did a propensity score match analysis where we matched patients according to uh, the risk of, uh, or, or divide them into three risk groups. That is the risk of death within one year and the propensity for that. And then we had uh, low risk patients, intermediate risk patients and high risk patients. And we want to see was there any difference in the risk of NSAIDs in different risk groups. And we essentially like find that the risk is very similar of the individual NSAIDs in all risk groups. So, and this also talks about that, the, the, that we are only looking at confounding by indication. 
Okay. It is very important when we're looking at this data not only to look at relative risks, but also to look at what, what really does it mean, the clinical perspective of these results. What are we uh, looking at? And that's the absolute risk increase, because we know from trials, we are always like looking at a drug that's li that decreases the risk by 50%, but if the absolute risk decreases only 1%, then the clinical importance of this is more, maybe not so much. And we need to treat many patients to save or, 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 or prevent an event. But these are high-risk populations. And if we look at, these are unadjusted numbers, but if you look at the absolute risk increase for the COX-2 inhibitors in patients with myocardial infarction, you're talking about 7% risk increase on, in one year of death. These are huge numbers. I don't know if you have any trials that, that reduce the risk by 7%. They are very rare. At, 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 and, and if you look at half failure patients, you see that the rovicoxib increases the risk by 11%, and, and diclofenac 9%, and 4% in MI patients. And putting it in another perspective is, is how many patients do we need to treat or to cause one harm, the number needed to harm. And, and, and if you look at those numbers, here you have those, then you have to treat 13 to 14 patients with myocardial infarction with a COX-2 inhibitor to cause one additional death. 9 to 14 patients with heart failure. And if you look at diclofenac, 24 patients with, with, with myocardial infarction and 11, 11 patients with heart failure. If we were presenting these numbers in trial or for the FDA right now, do you believe that these drugs could be allowed on the market? Probably not. Of course, we need to be careful in interpreting these results. They are observational, they are unadjusted, but it just like, illustrates the magnitude of, the, of the, the risk problem. Okay. Another study, well, uh, well uh, what we, after we have like, conducted these studies on, on patients with established heart disease, we wanted to like, look at patients who had uh, so didn't have any disease, like healthy individuals. And that's where Emil came in and, and he defined a, a population of extremely healthy individuals. And that's it, what we did was to, to, to define uh, individuals that didn't have any hospital admission, that didn't have any chronic uh, drug use uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a period, and, uh, and look at the NSAID use in those interests and risk. And these are, these are two Two, it was published in 2009. So, uh, uh, oh, so I had this wrong. Uh, excuse, I uh, apologize. And uh, and another study published last year in in circulation cardiac quality outcomes, where we looked at the core specific risk, like what were those like individuals dying of, or or, or, or was it that they were dying of cancer or or any pain related condition, or were they dying of a heart disease? And uh, what we find is these are young individuals. They didn't have any prior hospital admission, so they are about 40 to 50 years of age. They are equally distributed, a, a bit more females were using the, the COX-2 inhibitors compared to the non-selective NSAIDs. Commonly used dosages, 1,200 milligram uh, ibuprofen, 100 milligram diclofenac, and the median duration of treatment was about two to three weeks. And we have in all, there were a million individuals we, were in, uh, we had like included and about five million person years in, in the analysis. And uh, what we find is the, this, this is the risk of the combined endpoint of death or myocardial infarction. What we see is there is a Dose-related increase in risk. Ibuprofen increases the risk of by a f about with a factor two. The same for diclofenac a high dosage, and uh, we see the COX-2 inhibitors increase the risk almost fivefold. We didn't find uh, so it's not significant for naproxen, but it's very little use of naproxen in, in Denmark. So, so you see the confidence intervals is is, is pretty wide. Uh, but we essentially find the same as for the sick individuals. And here it's also important to like, put it into perspective because these are low-risk individuals. Also, we, but we almost have the same relative risk increase. 
And but if you look, if you remember the first like slides that we showed you about how much, how how many had used NSRDs, you have about six percent of the population are using NSRDs, and so so it's it, it's even though the, the the absolute risk increase is, is small, it has a huge impact because so many individuals are using it. And we, we essentially calculated that the, the magnitude of the problem was that we were probably having the same amount of people dying, or the same like, number of patients dying from NSID use as, as were offered for traffic accidents in Denmark. Uh, what Emil also did was to look at, this is the second article in, in circulation cardiovascular quality for outcome, was to look at like the, the, the individual like death causes, because in Denmark we have like, the causes of death registered according to death certificates from, from, from physicians. So we have also that registered. And uh, what we essentially found that these patients were dying from coronary death, or, or cardiovascular death, or, and what was also important, we found that ibuprofen was associated with increased risk of stroke, fatal or non-fatal stroke. And, um, and we also found that for naproxen, this was very interesting. Uh, and uh, he has also, Emil has also looked at that the type of stroke, but it was it were dying of a hemorrhagic stroke because inside these also interact with the platelet effect or were dying for an ischemic stroke. And we essentially found that there, were, there was a higher risk of ischemic stroke and, and that's, we, I think, I believe we are the first to show that. And we also find this, always this dose-related response risk. And that's a very strong signal within pharmacoepidemiology to, to see, to, like, to find a dose-related response in risk. Okay. Uh, a new field we are like exploring now is the effect of duration of treatment because uh, <coughs> some studies have suggested that you can like the, the risk of NSAIDs is increased early in treatment and also because the current recommendations from the American Heart Disease Association is that you use NSAIDs uh, in low dosages and for a short time period of time as possible in patients with cardiovascular disease. And these are, like, it sounds wise, but there is no, like, justification for this advice because we have no, like, studies that have really looked at the effect of, of duration of treatment. There are some, like, data from the uh, pro trial uh, or, and uh, that show that there was an early separation of risk already after, after a few months of treatment. So what we did here, these are patients with myocardial infarction. What we did here was to divide the treatment period in, in weeks. These are incidence rates of uh, death. And what we find that even after one week of treatment, these are all uh, NSIDs, the risk is almost double. This is the baseline risk in the population. And we find that the risk is, is it's doubled early in, uh, at the start of treatment. So, so it really indicates that there is no safe period. And if we... If we look at the individual NSIDs, we see it for the Cox, selected COX-2 inhibitors. And what is also alarming, this is diclofenac, and, and diclofenac is coming again and again as the, maybe the, the, the least safe NSID and probably has the same magnitude of risk as the selected COX-2 inhibitors, that the risk is very increased early in treatment and, and it's a persistently increased risk. Uh, we have also like, conducted the Cox regression analysis. This is time-dependent analysis where we divide the treatment period in one week, uh, two weeks uh, after 30 days, and 30 to 90 days, and then after 90 days. And, if, and this is for all NSIDs, and we see that there is a persistently increased risk of death. And we see it for Ropicoxib, early on increased risk and for silicoxib, and we also see it importantly for diclofenac. We have a, a has ratio of 3.6 after the first week of treatment. So this essentially also like confirms that there is no safe period of time, and maybe we should just like 
make a statement that we shouldn't use NSAIDs at all in patients with cardiovascular disease. There is no safe period of time. Be of course, there are some people who are needing these drugs, but uh, and and maybe can't not, cannot avoid them. And uh, and uh, but we need to be very careful with these drugs. Uh, and also, what we have, we are looking at this is this is the what about the time after myocardial infarction? Uh, we know that like the risk after myocardial infarction is early, high, and then diminishes after time uh, after the myocardial infarction. What we s uh, oops, see here is that this is the baseline risk in the population, and we have like divided the in, in in years after after discharge from myocardial infarction. And we see for the NSAIDs that the risk is, is high at start and, but, and gets a little bit lower, but we also see that the risk gets lower in the baseline population, uh, in, all, uh, in the control populations for not using NSAIDs. But we see even after five years of treatment, there is a persistently increased risk. And what was very interesting to see, that was the Cox regression analysis. And we were like very, like, we thought when we first saw these results, we were like t doubting that it was correct because we were seeing that the risk, like, relatively increased after, like, with the time after myocardial infarction. But there is an explanation for this, which we believe is that, like, the, the relative difference gets like higher. The magnitude of the risk of NSAIDs gets like larger after time from myocardial infarction because, like, the risk should be lower after time from myocardial infarction, but we see that the magnitude of the risk of NSAIDs gets higher. So, even after five years. Uh, another study we, uh, we have uh, looked at, it, it's, we are using the Danish registry of uh, out-of-hospital cardiac arrests. We have all cardiac uh, arrests in Denmark are registered in a, in a central registry. So, we took this register and like linked it with our pharmaco data and, and looked at where these individuals who are having heart attack, where they're using NSAIDs in close association with the, the event. This is a case crossover analysis and, and it's a very suitable analysis because we are like looking at that acute event and, and like close relation in time. And uh, what we find here is that both of the Cox-2 inhibitors, they are like, uh, uh, have a, uh, if I felt, two-fold increase in risk. And also we see diclofenac again, uh, a higher risk of cardiac arrest. And well, is that plausible? There is at least one analyzer that has shown that rofecoxib is associated with increased risk of uh, ventricular fibrillation. So, so we are working on this study. It was essentially presented for two years ago, but uh, uh, we are hopefully finishing it uh, soon. So this is a very interesting analysis. Okay, then we will change topic. And uh, I will uh, talk about the protein pump inhibitors. And like uh, pro you probably have heard of those discussion about that protein pump inhibitors interact with clodogrel and and there we could reduce the, the clinical effect of clodogrel because clodogrel is a prodrug that needs metabolism in the liver and, uh, and clodogrel and protein pump inhibitors are eliminated or metabolized by the same cytochrome system in the liver. So there was, uh, the, the theory is that uh, protein pump inhibitors uh, reduce like the metabolism of clodogrel into the active metabolite and there we could reduce the the clinical effect of clodogrel in inhibiting the platelets. And there are some uh, ex vitro studies that have shown that this is really the case, that you're seeing like, less platelet inhibition by clodogrel if you like put it in, if you take protein pump inhibitors similarly. And you also said at least two large uh, obstetrician studies, one from uh, Canada, which was a Medicare study with uh, patients over five, 65 years of age and one study, I think, it's a VA study with only like 98% males in it. So what we wanted to do was to replicate these results in a nationwide cohort. And like, well, we have an ideal uh, population of Denmark, so 
We, uh, we uh, identified our patients with uh, MI, and Clopidogrel was introduced in the market about 2000 in Denmark. So we defined the population with first-time myocardial infarction in 2000-2006, and so we excluded patients who uh, didn't survive the first 30 days and included patients only alive 30 days after discharge. And then we divided them into two groups, those who were taking not taking clopidogrel and those who were taking clopidogrel, and further divided them into two groups, those who were not taking potent and those who were taking potent inhibitors in both groups. And because we wanted to see the effect of protein pump inhibitors in both groups, where we like seeing the same effect in those who are not taking protein pump inhibitors. And, and the reason for this is, is if you look at those events, so these are patients not taking clopidogrel and these are ta patients taking clopidogrel. If you look at the event rates that you see that patients who are not taking protein pump inhibitors, they have lower event rates compared to patients who are taking protein pump inhibitors. And we see the same in patients who are taking clopidogrel, lower event rate without protein pump, protein pump inhibitors compared to protein pump inhibitor use. So, well, that looks like, looks like there has nothing to do with clopidogrel or what. So, when we look at the baseline of the of like patient characteristics of the patients, we saw that patients who were taking protein pump inhibitors, they were older in both groups. We saw they were, had a lower socioeconomic class and we saw also saw that they had a higher comorbidity like compared to those who were not taking clopidogrel. So it could be a confounding by indication we looked at. So what we further did, we did a, a, like a propensity score matching where we this match on the, on the propensity for taking clopidogrel within the first year after discharge and further matched two populations, like within the, the cohort of no clopidogrel use, we matched patients not taking protein pump inhibitors, about 8,500, with those taking protein pump inhibitors. And similarly, in the clopidogrel group, 6,500 patients not taking protein pump, in, protein pump inhibitors compared to patients taking, matched with patients taking protein pump inhibitors. And uh, we found this, they were very balanced in the, in the, in the distribution of the propensity score. Uh, and uh, after the masking, we saw that they were very similar in baseline. They were at the same age, 73 years in the no uh, clopidogrel group and 67 years in the clopidogrel group. They had a similar uh, socioeconomic status, similar comorbidity, and, and you also see that the, the, the P values are well above uh, 0.05, so there was, uh, they were well balanced in, in baselines, like within the, each group. And uh, this is the Kaplan Meier uh, curve, and, and you should like compare these two together and, and these two together. And, and you see, these are clopidogrel users, they have a lower event rate, those who are not taking protein pump inhibitors compared to those who are taking, pro taking protein pump inhibitors and the same in the no clopidogrel group. And it's essentially the same difference. And uh, in our, uh, our uh, cost regression analysis, we found that those are patients not taking protein pump inhibitors, the reference group, and those who were only taking PPI compared in the no clopidogrel group, we saw they had a hazard ratio of, of almost 1.4, and in the PPI and clopidogrel group, we saw that it, the, the risk was the same, point of, point of 1.4 hazard ratio. And, and then we did the hazard rate ratio and found it was very, very close to one, and it really indicates the, the risk difference between these two, it, between the no clopidogrel groups and the clopidogrel groups. Uh, it essentially says the magnitude of the effect of PPI and the P4 interaction uh, uh, 0.72. So there is uh, no significant difference between these two hazard ratios. That is the clopidogrel group and the no clopidogrel group. It's, it's a bit tricky to understand. I hope you can take it backwards. And if you looked at the, at the propensity score analysis, we also, this is the group with the propensity score match cohort, we found that the, the magnitude of PPI in those groups and the no clopidogrel group and the clopidogrel group was the same. 
We also wanted to look at what about is there a dose-related response in this? Because if PPI were like causing, the, causing some interaction, then we probably would see like higher risk with higher dosages. And we we found on the contrary, there was there was no like six, uh, the P for difference was not significant, and we essentially saw that low PPI dose was had a higher risk compared to high PPI dose in both drugs. Both groups, clobidogrel groups and no clobidogrel no, group, <laughs> and no clobidogrel group. And there's also been a discussion about the individual PPIs, that is, like omeprazole, should have a higher like, affinity for the for the for the cytochrome-like system uh, compared to the other uh, PPIs, and, and should give like have higher risk of like uh, cardio adverse events, but we essentially found uh, this is this is the no clobidogrel group, and this is the clobidogrel group, and we essentially find that the, there is no significant difference between the individual PPIs. So, in uh, our conclusion to this like study is that there is an increased risk uh, for adverse outcomes associated with PPI, but it's regardless of use of clobidogrel. So it's, it's not associated with clobidogrel. And we find, we can like find this in a propensity score mask, MEDS analysis also, where they are like equal in, in baseline. And like our conclusion that it probably is caused by some unmeasured confounders that we can't like control for in, in our studies, uh, in this kind of study at least. So, uh, and like we are not having like we have no information about clinical variables like smoking or cholesterol level and, and, and such things. So there could be some residual compounding that we are like exp looking at here. Okay. Well, the next study that, uh, that this is a study which is not published yet. It's it's, it's submitted and uh, and but but we wanted to look at both what about aspirin because there are actually some studies that have like indicated that there could be an interaction between PPIs and aspirin because uh, aspirin uh, needs uh, acid environment to be absorbed and if PPIs like lower the acidity in the in the stomach then it could like interfere with the with the absorption of aspirin and thereby diminish the clinical effect and we also have some like studies that have actually shown that there is some interaction and with uh, in, in, in ex vivo studies uh, at least so, but here it is a little tricky, more tricky, because we can't divide patients into aspirin users and non-aspirin users because aspirin is a cheap drug also in Denmark and it can be like bought over the counter and not all physicians are like prescribing aspirin because it's so cheap and you don't get any reimbursement like from the, from the healthcare authorities. So, so what we did was to be absolutely like certain that we are looking at aspirin user. We are at only included patients. We were like uh, certain that they had at least uh, claimed one prescription of aspirin after discharge. These are also MI patients. We excluded clobidogrel users to like to get rid of that uh, out of our analysis and we included patients who are uh, like uh, surviving 30 days after discharge. So we had 20,000 patients with a myocardial infarction. And here we, we divided them into two groups, those who filled uh, a prescription for PPI within one year, uh, 15,000 patients and 4,000 patients who, uh, no, those who did not fill a prescription for PPA and uh, those who filled a prescription for PPI, uh, 4,000 patients. And uh, again, uh, just to like illustrate, we, we find the same differences. PPI users, they are older, have more, more comorbidity and uh, so they are more prone to like have higher event rate, and we also did a we, we did a uh, sub analysis with a propensity score mass population, which were balanced in in baselines about 4,000 patients in each group. And and this is the Kaplan analysis. This is the uh, the combined endpoint of cardiovascular death, uh, MI or stroke, and you can see that uh, aspirin uses that they're not using PPI, they have a lower event rate and patients who are taking PPI and aspirin have a higher event rate. We repeated in our uh, 
time-dependent cost regression analysis uh, has the ratio of, of almost 1.5 for the combined endpoint compared to no PPI used on with a higher rate of death and higher rate of cardiovascular death and my MI and stroke and we essentially find the same in the in the propensity score mass analysis and even stronger association. Uh, we also see, and um, that was very important, when we looked at the individual PPIs, we find the same magnitude of risk for all PPIs, but we did not find any increase in risk associated with uh, uh, antihistamine use, like the old ulcer drugs, uh, uh, the H2 receptor blockers. So that was very interesting because if it was uh, like acidity problem in the, uh, or absorption problem, then we should see the same. And also the indication is essentially the same for H2 receptor blockers as for PPIs. But uh, few patients using uh, those and the wide confidence intervals. But it doesn't seem to be any increased risk. So, and here we did this like uh, the important to see like if we were looking at unmeasured compounders, what should the magnitude of risk have to be to like to explain the risk increase associated with PPIs? And if the prevalence of the confounder was 20% in the cohort, then we had to the, the confounder had to have fourfold increase in risk. So it had been had to be a confounder with a very 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 high risk, and it's it's very hard to like think of a, of a confounder, which we, like an amazing confounder that has that magnitude of risk. And even if the risk factor was 30%, then it had to be like increase the risk threefold. So, and, and like that's, that's interesting because if you're talking about smoking, smoking doesn't increase risk by, f by factor four. Uh, and so, so it may be that we are looking at some kind of effect of PPS in itself. So, well, we are very careful in, in our like interpretation of these resources because they are, they are like, uh, well, because PPIs are like drugs that some patients might need. But we, in, in, in fact, in, uh, but our conclusion was that in aspirin treated patients with unreasoned MI, we found that PPIs are associated with increased risk of cardiovascular effects which we didn't found with the H2 receptor blockers. And uh, we also f like find it, it's unlikely but not impossible that their results are caused by some unmeasured confounders. But uh, absolutely we need further studies of this. And, uh, and it's, I think these are very interesting results because it could be like we are looking at some completely different effect to PPIs than we were thinking of. So it's a, it's a generator for a hypothesis for further research. Okay, we have some time left. Yeah, I'll look. This is a very recent study published in Jack here in January, and uh, where we also wanted to look at calcium channel blockers. Well, why calcium channel blockers? Well, because they also have a potential interaction with clotogrel. And there has some hypothesis that calcium channel blockers could like decrease the clinical effect of clotogrel. And again, we, uh, we uh, included uh, uh, our patients who were, uh, who had, uh, who had a first time myocardial infarction in 2000, 2006, and uh, I survived 30 days of stitches, so uh, almost 57,000 patients. And we divided them into two groups, those taking clobrogrel and not taking clobrogrel, and uh, and then uh, we looked at patients who are taking calcium channel blockers and not taking calcium channel blockers in each group. Uh, and we find that, uh, like uh, we have, this is the Cox regression analysis. We find that calcium channel blockers uh, are associated with increased risk, uh, despite uh, uh, on their using clopidogrel or not. We found that the hazard rate ratio was. Not, uh, not statistically significant of, with a p-value of 0.08. And uh, we f in the propensity score match analysis where we, where we matched patients, so they were equally based on because they were calcium channel blockers, patients were older and they were, had more uh, comorbidity. 
again, and we found essenti oops, uh, essentially very similar hazard ratio in both groups, deep, uh, independent of cloaked well use, and the hazard and the hazard rate ratio of almost one, and the uh, p-value of 0.9. So, and if we looked at the individual uh, calcium channel blockers, we didn't found any significant difference between those, in, between the two groups. So, but we found this that we, we do not like this study does not support any concerns about the, the safety of use of calcium channel blockers and clopidogrel together. So, uh, at last we have, uh, yeah, we have a little time, so we have good time for discussion. Uh, this is a study we, we look, want to look at the antiarrhythmic uh, anti drugs in patients with atrial fibrillation. And we know from, like previously, from the CAS study that the CAS 1C antiarrhythmic anti drugs were associated with like, increased risk of death in patients with MI. And we wanted to look at this population in Denmark, like uh, who, who had, were discharged with after hospitalization with atrial fibrillation, and to look at if we were like if this was reflected in this population, if we were like use of uh, antiarrhythmic drugs was associated with higher uh, risk of death. And uh, we had uh, about 140,000 patients who were uh, admitted with uh, atrial fibrillation in Denmark. And uh, what I want to point out is that it was interesting to see the average age in the population was about 73 years. And if we looked at the patients who were taking the class 1C antiarrhythmic, we saw that they were much, much, much younger. They were about 60 years for flicanide or and uh, 64 years for propofenone and 66 years of sotalol. And uh, for amiodarone, we also looked at six higher, like a higher age. So already here it's, it's like smelling of something suspicious that this is there and we are not looking at the same patients. And we also confirmed this. We were very excited when we like look at, at this graph. These are event rates, so these are unadjusted analysis. And we saw that patients who were not taking any arrhythmics, antiarrhythmics, they had a higher, the highest event rate. And we saw that patients who were taking propofenone or flaconate, they had the lowest event rate. So uh, we were excited that, we, well, is this device choice to use antiarrhythmic drugs in this population, in antiarrhythmic, uh, in, in atrial fibrillation patients, does it prevent death? Well, if you look at the, at the other slide, it really shows that we are looking at completely different population. And it's also like, I want to like show you this study because it illustrates that it's, that even though we are excited about the studies, it's important to like interpret it with like wisely and uh, carefully. We are just looking at the age difference here. They are, they are, in the amiot, if you look at the baseline, we saw that, for example, the amiodron group, there we had higher proportion of patients with macular infarction, with heart failure, and concomitant diseases. We had almost uh, no patients uh, uh, with, who are taking the class 1C antiarrhythmic drugs with, with heart failure or macular infarction. So we are just looking at a, a, a sicker population. And, and, uh, even in our, uh, we did uh, three kinds of like analysis to like, confirm our research. We did a, 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 a Cox regression analysis of the whole population. We see uh, the, that the reference is one that is no antiarrhythmic drug use, and these are time-dependent analyses. We see that the lowest risk is in the the, the class one C uh, analysis. And we, we find it in the propensity score match analysis, and we also did it in, uh, 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 performed the case crossover analysis. So our conclusion is not that like antiarrhythmic drugs are safe to use in, in atrial fibrillation patients, but that we, in this population we did not find any increased risk of death. And we found like our conclusion is that like we are good selecting appropriate patients for these drugs. And, and we are not seeing, like, it is not co causing, like, at least, increased uh, the risk in, in this particular cohort of patients. So, and, and, and uh, like, 
it also confirms that we are like following guidelines in Denmark, so that's very good. And it also underscores the importance of individual patient selection when we are like using uh, class 1C antiviral drugs. So, uh, well, that was the end of my talk. And if you have any questions or, or comments, uh, let's be happy to answer it. Thank you very much for your attention. Are you? <laughs> yeah, <it's great. laughs> well, for, first off, uh, welcome. We're <laughs> glad that you're here, and we look forward to uh, having you on campus the next couple of days. Um, when, I, when I look at all this non-steroidal data, I mean, it's obviously uh, frightening. It looks like uh, you're killing off a bunch of Danes in a, uh, in a, in a systematic way here with 60% of people taking them. But how is your government reacting to this and the policymakers? Are they looking at this with that same sort of, you know, sort of view that you're putting forward? Because I look at this and say, this looks bad. We ought to do a randomized clinical trial before we do anything else. Um, but you just keep seem to be finding more of the same. And you, I, I think at some point you have to say you believe it and uh, these drugs shouldn't be prescribed or you should say it's a great hypothesis. We ought to test it. And you would seem to have a, a construct for testing it, given your outstanding data capture abilities. Yeah, well, it would be ideal to perform a, a, like a, a randomized study, but I think it would be difficult because you need a sponsor for it. And the drug companies are, companies are not... How involved. about your government? I mean, would well, they rather um, be killing its citizens? Or? Yeah, absolutely. And I'd be like, we have tried to talk to the Danish Medicines Agency, and we were proud of the image study came out. They that diclofenac was taking off the market, uh, of the, uh, not of the market, but as a as a as a OTC mm -hmm. drug. They had recently like uh, lanced it as an OTC drug, so it was removed as an OTC drug. Well, what we what, like the authorities are not like interested in removing NSAIDs. I don't know why, and but like and they, they really. They, they, they say that we are looking at observational data and we really don't believe that until we have a clinical trial, but they don't want to sponsor a clinical trial. And, and the same is for the European Medicines Agency. They are really not responding on, uh, on, uh, on these data. And it's not, not only our data because they, they have been replicated like widely. So, so, so far there is no better regulation. Well, well, I have uh, taken the initiative to with um, the, the Danish Cardiac Society, and we have written like specific like recommendation using for using NSAIDs in papers with cardiovascular disease. So we are like recommending that you're not using them. We're recommending some alternative pain uh, uh, killing uh, pain medications in patients with cardiovascular disease, and like if we like can't avoid NSAID use then like using maybe low doses of naproxen uh, if, if, uh, if at all. So, so that's, that's what we have been trying to do. So, and I think it has been like distributed sudden, slowly through, through the, like the five years we've been presenting these results and, and I, I hope that physicians are more aware of it now. Yeah. Thank you. I'm curious about the availability of the NSA IDs over the counter. So if you are actually capturing all of the data of who's using it, I understand the aspirin is easily available, but what about the ibuprofen and naproxen? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, in Denmark, uh, ibuprofen is the only OTC, uh, OTC uh, NSA ID, and it's only in uh, low doses, 200 milligram maximum, and you have a maximum of 100 uh, tablets uh, you can use. And due to the reimbursement system, we, we believe that like patients who are needing high dosages and like maybe long-term treatment, they are probably will get a prescription for from the doctor. We have a analog, the, uh, the, the OTC NSIDs was first give, released uh, in 2001, yeah, and we have like uh, like to try to look at our analysis by looking at before and after and uh, after OTC. Uh, now, uh, I prefer when we didn't find any like difference in in our risk estimates. So, so, so we are probably looking at the effect of OTC. Uh, I prefer is probably not uh, substantial.
Yeah, hi, um, I mean, this is really compelling data, observational data, and I was wondering how, um, I guess from a methodological perspective and discussion pers perspective, how do you separate the underlying inflammatory condition from the drug itself? Yeah, well, you can't, like, separate. You, 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 can, you can try to isolate patients who are not having any inflammatory disease as a diagnosis in these data. Uh, it doesn't change the results. And, uh, and, and you, if you look at the magnitude, like, like of the, the number of patients who are using these drugs, it's unlikely that they are all having, like, some kind of inflammatory disease. They're not having, like, you're not having 35 to 6% of the population with a rheumatoid arthritis or, or some other kind of inflammatory <coughs> disease. So it's unlikely it will, like, contribute much to this, like, data due to the magnitude of the risk. Uh, we have, like, looked at specific diagnosis, tried to, like, remove it from our analysis, and, and we still have the same, like, magnitude of risk. The other way to get rid of this is to look for our off-target. If it is truly confounding by this, you, should, you, you could look for an off-target disease, uh, pneumonia, cancer, something else, okay. and show that, in fact, in those populations treated with uh, non steroidals you don't see increased risk. Uh, so, um, have you tried to do those sorts of studies? Oh, we haven't uh, done it yet. No. Oh, that's, that's a good idea. Great. No. Thank you.